welcome everyone to this week's episode, kindly sponsored by Audible. Now, in keeping with the channel's policy of only accepting sponsorships from services I actually use and can therefore genuinely recommend, I can tell you that Audible really does have a huge range of books, podcasts, etc. As you can see here from this screenshot from my Audible front screen, the bestsellers and new releases perhaps less of an interest to me, but you can see that based on the uh, viewing and purchases, well, they seem to have got me pretty locked in, at least as far as my interests go. And speaking of those interests, here's what they have in a simple naval history search. And as you can see, there's a number of interesting titles going on here, as well as podcasts. And I have a number of these books in physical form, but a number of the ones listed here, I don't. And this is just the front page of, I think, nine in this search. So I'll probably be picking a few of these up to listen to them over the next few months. And of course, there's also the app. So it's all very well having a physical library. Great for research at home, but if I'm going out, then I can't really <laughs> take it all with me. It does get a little heavy. So in that case, it's a pop in the earphones, pick something that uh, I've already started listening to, or once I've got through all of those, something that I want to listen to in the future, hit play and wander off quite happily, imbibing even more knowledge. So if you want to give it a shot, then, well, why not let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired or be entertained? New members can try Audible for free for 30 days by visiting audible.com slash Drakinafel or texting Drakinafel to 500, 500 So with thanks to Audible once again, let's get on with the show. It was the 7th century AD. The Byzantine Empire was on the ropes. Having spent decades fighting a knockdown, drag-out war with the Persians, to little overall effect. The conflict had left both sides exhausted and vulnerable to a massive wave of Arab armies under the Rashidun Caliphate. Sassanid Persia fell first in the second quarter of the 7th century, quickly followed by a number of territories that the Byzantines had only just recaptured. It seems that our story starts here, since the various sources that are available vary somewhat as to the exact nature of the source of the vital information that was soon to reach Constantinople, but almost all of them agree that the knowledge was carried out of this series of conquests by various displaced scholars, or perhaps just one. By the 670s, the succeeding Umayyad Caliphate had set its eyes on the Byzantine capital, and starting in either 672 or 673, great fleets flying the banners of Islam had blockaded Constantinople for most of each year, leaving in the winter, and had supplied huge armies that besieged the city's great walls. By 678, the siege had been going on and off for about half a decade, and there was precious little the outnumbered Byzantine navy could do to lift it. Then a lifeline was offered. Whether this was by a conclave of displaced scholars from Alexandria, or one especially smart engineer from Heliopolis, who history names as Kalinikos, the lifeline in question was an incendiary mixture that would become known to those of us now as Greek fire. Incendiaries of some form or another were not new to the ancient world. Numerous recipes and accounts of their use survive to this day, and doubtless still more were known at the time. But each of these mixtures had a limitation or two. Some of them were pastes that had to be applied directly, Others were more easily projected at the enemy, but could be put out by water, or the target could be rendered immune simply by the application of something like wet animal hides or thick cloth that had been soaked in water beforehand. But this mixture was different. Whatever it was made of was placed in copper or bronze vessels and then heated. It could then be projected by use of a pressurised pump system known as a siphon, which produced an impressive jet of flaming liquid. Moreover, this liquid was capable of burning on water. Some said it even ignited, or at least burned more fiercely, in contact with water or other damp materials. Some accounts even describe a grenade that was made up of two pots, a smaller internal one containing the Greek fire liquid, which sat in a larger one, with the intervening gap being filled with water. Upon landing, both would break, and the water would then ignite the Greek fire. Other, more conventional pots that were just full of Greek fire were also available. The only way to extinguish this incendiary seems to be by either piling large amounts of sand over it, thus robbing it of all oxygen, or else using something like vinegar to neutralise it. 
neither of which were in particularly easy reach or available in particularly large quantities aboard a typical warship of the time. This was further compounded by the roaring sound the intense flames were said to make, which had a something of a demoralising effect on their targets. Equipped with these devices, the Byzantine fleet sailed out and promptly set a good portion of the Arabic fleet aflame. Unable to counter this new weapon, the enemy fleet withdrew and the siege was broken. On the way back, a storm sank many of the remaining vessels and Constantinople was saved for the moment. The Chronicle of Theophanes the Confessor, who wrote a history of much of the Byzantine Empire in the latter part of the first millennium AD, related in part regarding the siege. The enemy kept this up from the month of April until September. Then, turning back, they went to Kizikos, which they captured, and wintered there. And in the spring they set out, and in similar fashion, made war on sea against the Christians. After doing the same for seven years, at that time Kalinikos, an architect from Heliopolis in Syria, took refuge with the Romans and manufactured a naval fire with which he kindled the ships of the Arabs and burnt them with their crews. In this way, the Romans came back in victory and acquired the naval fire. It seems that the creation of the substance was confined, for security reasons, to the capital itself, and thus, whilst it would be used to a certain degree thereafter, it seems that most of the siphons and their fuel were removed and stored away for a future crisis. Indeed, it would be about another four decades before it pops up again in recorded history as the threat of the Islamic fleets returned. In approximately 713 AD, the following is recorded regarding the growing tensions. Artemios, for his part, appointed very able strategoi of the cavalry Thermata and learned officials to fill civil posts, and so remained secure. And as the Arabs were preparing an armament against the Roman country by land and by sea, the emperor sent a number of dignitaries to Ualid in Syria on the pretext of negotiating peace. Among them, Daniel Sinopites, the patrician and prefect of the city whom he instructed to inform himself thoroughly concerning the expedition against the Roman country and the enemy's strength. When this man had gone and come back, he reported to the emperor their great armament of land and sea forces. Then the emperor commanded that each man should store provisions for himself up to a period of three years, and anyone not having the means to do so should leave the city. He appointed overseers and started building dromons, fire-carrying viremes and great triremes. He restored the sea walls and likewise the land walls, and set up on the towers catapults for darts and stones and other engines. Having fortified the city as much as he was able, he stored a great quantity of produce in the imperial depots, and so made himself safe. Four years later, the emperor Artemios had been replaced by the emperor Leo, or one of them at least, and now these preparations would be put to the test when the enemy made their way to the capital once again as related in the accounts thus. Now Masalmus, after he had wintered in Asia, was awaiting Leo's promises. But when he had received nothing from Leo and realised that he had been tricked, he moved to Abydos, crossed over to Thrace with a considerable army, and advanced towards the imperial city. He also wrote to the caliph Suleiman that the latter should come with the fleet that had been fitted out in advance. After devastating the Thracian forts, Masalmus laid siege to the city on the 15th of August. The Arabs fenced the land walls all around by digging a wide trench and building above it a breast-high parapet of dry stone. On the 1st of September, Suleiman sailed up with his fleet and his emirs. He had enormous ships, military transports and dromons to the number of 1,800. He put in between the Magnoara and the Kikliobion, Two days later, a south wind blew, and they set out from there and sailed past the city. Some of them crossed over to the suburbs of Eutropios and Anthemios, while others put in on the Thracian side, from the fort of Galata all the way to the Clydeon. Since the big ships were heavily laden and moved slowly, some twenty transports protected the rear, each one of them guarded by a hundred men clad in corslets. These found themselves becalmed in the midst of the current, and when a slight breeze blew down the straits, they were pushed back. Straight away the pious emperor sent against them the fire-bearing ships from the Acropolis, and, with divine help, set them on fire, 
so that some of them were cast burning by the sea walls, others sank to the bottom with their crews, and others were swept down flaming as far as the islands Oxia and Platea. As a result, the inhabitants of the city took courage, whereas the enemy cowered with fear after experiencing the efficacious action of the liquid fire, for they had intended to beach their ships that evening by the sea walls, and set their steering paddles upon the battlements. Not to be perturbed, the enemy tried again the next year, but to little better effect. The account reads, That winter proved very severe in Thrace, so much so that for a hundred days the earth could not be seen beneath the congealed snow. As a result, the enemy lost a multitude of horses, camels and other animals. In the spring, Sufiam arrived with a fleet that had been built in Egypt. He had 400 transports laden with corn as well as dromons. Having been informed of the efficacy of the Roman fire, he sailed past Bithynia and crossed to the harbour of Kalos Ag Agros on the other side, where he anchored. Shortly thereafter, Izid too arrived with another fleet that had been built in Africa. He had 360 transports, a store of arms and provisions. He had received the same information about the liquid fire, and so put in at Satyros and Brias, all the way to Cartaliman. Now the Egyptian crews of these two fleets took counsel among themselves, and after seizing at night the skiffs of the transports, sought refuge in the city and acclaimed the emperor. As they did so, the sea, all the way from Hieria to the city, appeared to be covered with timber. When the emperor had been informed by them of the two fleets hidden in the bay, he constructed fire-bearing siphons which he placed on in dromons and biremes and sent these against the fleets. Having once again proved the effectiveness of the weapon, the Byzantine fleet saw something of a resurgence, albeit the name of the weapon they used varied. We, of course, call it Greek fire today, but back in those days it was known as Roman fire by outsiders, and internally went by liquid fire, marine fire, prepared fire, naval fire, artificial fire, median fire, uh, Kalinikos, Kalinikos fire, dragon's breath, and many other titles. Depending on how you read the sources, it may be that the fire projecting technology was already known, and the new invention was simply a much better fuel, or, as with so many ancient accounts, a few lines indicating the preparation of siphon-equipped ships at the start of the siege of the 670s may simply be slightly out of order, the ships actually being made ready during the siege rather than at the start of it. In any case, by the mid-720s it seemed that the Arab fleets were not returning to Constantinople anytime soon, and so, under an unpopular emperor, the Byzantine Empire fell into something else that it was very good at, civil war. Unfortunately for the rebels, the secrets of making both Greek fire and its projectors were so closely guarded at the capital that even when a substantial fleet of rebels arrived intent on dethroning the emperor, it seems that the core of the imperial fleet was able to fairly casually dispose of them. The account goes, At this juncture, the inhabitants of Hellas and the Cyclades, moved by divine zeal, came to an accord and revolted against him with a great fleet bringing in their train a certain Cosmas, who was to be crowned emperor. The expedition was commanded by Ag Agalianos, Tumark of the Helladics, and Stephen. They approached the imperial city on the 18th of April of the 10th indication, and, after joining battle with the people of Byzantium, had their ships burnt with artificial fire and were defeated. Some of them were drowned by the hollow, among them Agalianos, who threw himself in the sea armed as he was, whilst the survivors deserted to the emperor. Cosmas and Stephen were beheaded. It would be another two decades before the use of the weapon recurs on a major scale, but this time is also the first instance of it being unsuccessful in use. In an engagement with a nation named Kibiriots, the flame-equipped ships were actually chased away by the enemy fleet, Although not much is said of this engagement, it's likely that the wind was against them, as it seems that strong headwinds were sufficient to either curtail the range of the fire projectors or else make them a danger to their own ships from blowback. Nor was the weapon to stay exclusively in Byzantine hands for long. In the early 810s there was a war with the Bulgarians over the new emperor's refusal to honour a treaty that had been made with them by the previous emperor. 
during which time it is related, On the 4th of November was seen a comet in the shape of two luminous crescents, now united, now separated, so as to assume different forms and take on the likeness of a headless man. And on the following day we received the disastrous news of the cap- capture of Mesembria, which frightened everyone by the prospect of greater ills. For they found it filled with all manner of goods that are necessary for human habitation, and took possession of it, along with Debeltos, wherein they found thirty-six brass siphons and a considerable quantity of the liquid fire that is projected from them, as well as an abundance of gold and silver. That the loss of the siphons and the Greek fire was listed ahead of the gold and silver indicates just how valuable this weapon was seen to be. Uh, Nor would it be the last time that either a city with siphons and Greek fire stored in it would fall to an enemy, or else a Byzantine dromon so equipped was sometimes captured. But it seems that, luckily for the Byzantines, whoever captured these items was unable to replicate the siphon's technology, nor reverse-engineer the incendiary liquid itself, which limited their use of what they captured to whatever they happened to have in their possession at that time, without any replication. Captured Greek fire and other lesser incendiaries were therefore recorded as being deployed by means of catapult-flung projectiles and the like instead of the siphons, and the Byzantine navy itself also wasn't against the use of fire grenades and so forth. But these were much less effective on account of their relatively low accuracy, except at absolute point-blank range, and the limited quantity of Greek fire that could thus be delivered, as compared to the siphons which at close range could put out industrial-sized flamethrowers worth of burning liquid. The 820s saw another rebellion break out, this one under Thomas the Slav, and whilst his ships had some Greek fire aboard, it seems that they suffered from limited supplies, and thus despite some early successes at attacking the capital, the Imperial fleet was able to destroy both Thomas's main fleet and its recently arrived reinforcements. Greek fire would then be used again in the 10th and 11th centuries, this time against outside enemies for a change, as the Byzantines off-again, on-again relationship with the Kievan Rus led to wars against them, then alongside them against the Bulgarians, then against them again. Uh, In all cases, small forces of Byzantine ships equipped with siphon projectors appear to have been key in maintaining naval supremacy at sea, or, in the case of the Bulgarian War, on the Danube. However, it seems that something had happened in the century or so between the revolt of Thomas and these wars, as only smaller elements of the fleet seemed to carry the weapon, as opposed to earlier times, in which it was said, For when the Saracens go to war in a naval battle, the Byzantines make a furnace in the bows of their ships, on which they rest a vessel of bronze filled with all these oils, and place fire under it, and one of the crew, by means of a tube made of bronze, such as that called by country folk a squirt, with which boys play, sprays at the enemy. And this diminishment of its use seems to have continued, as by the time of the First Crusade, it seems that although many ships were armed with projectors, the supply of fire itself appears to be limited. In the Alexiad, the battle against the ships of one of the Italian city-states that was enriching itself in the Middle East at Byzantine expense is related thus. When the Franks moved out of Jerusalem to take the cities of Syria, they promised the Bishop of Pisa large rewards, if he would assist them in their proposed object. He agreed to their request and stirred up two others who dwelt on the coast to do the same, and then without any delay equipped biremes and triremes and dromons and other fast sailing ships amounting to 900 and sailed forth to meet them. He detached a number of the ships and sent them to pillage Corfu, Locas, Cephalenia and Zacynthus. On hearing this, the emperor ordered ships to be furnished by all the countries under the Roman sway. He had a number built in the capital itself, and would at intervals go around in a monoreme and instruct the shipwrights how to make them. As he knew that the Pisans were skilled in sea warfare, and dreaded a battle with them, on the prow of each ship he had a head fixed of a lion or other land animal made in brass or iron, with the mouth open and then gilded over, so that their mere aspect was terrifying and the fire which was to be directed against the enemy through tubes he made to pass through the mouths of the beasts, so that it seemed as if the lions and the other similar monsters were vomiting the fire. In this manner, 
Then these ships were prepared. He next sent for Tacticus, newly returned from Antioch, and gave him these ships and named him their supreme head. But the whole fleet he put under the command of Landulf and raised him to the dignity of Great Duke, as he was the most experienced in naval warfare. They left the capital in the course of the month of April and sailed to Samos with the Roman fleet. There they disembarked and hauled the ships up on land in order to make them stronger and more durable by tarring them over. But when they heard that the Pisan fleet had sailed past, they heaved up their anchors and hurried after them towards Cos, and reached that island in the evening while the Pisans had reached it in the morning. As they did not meet the Pisans, they sailed on to Canidus, which lies on the eastern continent. On arriving there, although they missed their prey, they yet they found a few Pisans who had been left behind, and inquired of them whither the Pisan fleet had gone, and they answered, to Rhodes. So they immediately loosed their cables and soon overtook them between Patara and Rhodes. When the Pisans caught sight of them, they speedily arranged their fleet in battle order and wetted their minds as well as their swords for the fray. As the Roman fleet was drawing near, a certain Peloponnesian count, Perichaetes by name, and a very expert navigator, had his ship of a single bank of oars rowed very quickly against the Pisans directly he saw them, and he passed right through the midst of them like fire, and then returned to the Roman fleet. The Roman fleet, however, did not venture upon a regular sea battle with the Pisans, but made a series of swift irregular attacks upon them. Landulf himself, first of all, drew close to the Pisan ships and threw fire at them, but aimed badly and thus accomplished nothing but wasting his fire. Then the man called Count Elimon very boldly attacked the largest vessel at the stern, but got entangled in its rudders, and as he could not free himself easily, he would have been taken, had he not, with great presence of mind, had recourse to his machine and poured fire upon the enemy very successfully. Then he quickly turned his ship around and set fire on the spot to three more of the largest barbarian ships. At the same moment, a squall of wind suddenly struck the sea and churned it up and dashed the ships together and almost threatened to sink them, for the waves roared, the yardarms creaked, and the sails were split. The barbarians now became thoroughly alarmed, firstly because of the fire directed upon them, for they were not accustomed to that kind of machine, nor to the fire, which naturally flames upward, but in this case was directed in whatever direction the sender desired, often downwards or laterally, and secondly they were much upset by the storm, and consequently they fled. This seems to have been the last time any large quantity of Greek fire was used in battle by the Byzantines, Although they assembled fireships in later accounts, they don't seem to have actually used them, and subsequently in the 13th century onwards, the use of various incendiaries collectively termed Greek fire appears in the accounts of various factions warring in the Crusades, but the descriptions turn subtly away from those previously recorded, and it seems that by this point the secret had likely either been lost, or required access to ingredients that were now beyond the reach of the reduced Byzantine Empire, and other lesser or different recipes were now in use on a limited basis in these other kingdoms. No doubt, numerous smaller engagements occurred between the large ones noted in the histories, although the use of the weapon seems to have been sparing at best, presumably in an effort to maintain its secrecy and the morale impact that its use would have at the most critical times. Greek fire would also be used on occasion on land, but with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453, any documents related to its precise creation were likely lost in the subsequent fires, if indeed it was ever written down at all, as some sources seem to indicate the knowledge was restricted to specific individuals and passed down by word of mouth, with perhaps some brief perishable notes in highly secured facilities assuming that it all hadn't been lost in one of the earlier sackings of Constantinople by various crusading forces. So, that brings us to the weapon itself, which in Byzantine use is a system that includes not just the liquid fire, but also the means of getting it to the enemy. For this we have primarily the aforementioned siphon. This appears by most scholarly consensus to have been a sealed chamber in which the liquid was preheated, and worked overall like a more dangerous version of most super soaker water rifles today. A pump was used to build up pressure behind the liquid, and upon opening of a valve, then the pressure would force the liquid out of a directable nozzle. 
Closing the valve, expenditure of all the pressure, or running out of fuel would bring the use of the fire to an end. Various reconstructions of this have been made. With some have double cylinders to provide a constant pressure to extend the time of projection, others have single cylinders and rely mostly on building up a pressure for a single charge. In any case, most of this, these systems have been made with materials that were available at the time, albeit obviously using modern tooling, and have worked perfectly well. However, the fuel itself is another matter. Exactly what it was remains unknown, but some conclusions have been drawn over the years, albeit the matter is still highly debated, with some erroneous claims also coming up from time to time. Amongst the latter are claims that the liquid used an early form of gunpowder, specifically the saltpetre element, and this is most commonly used to explain the booming or roaring sound that's often accredited to it. However, the first recorded references to gunpowder occur in 9th century AD China, two centuries after and a whole continent away from the first official recorded use of Greek fire. Saltpetre itself was known, again in Asia, considerably earlier than gunpowder as a whole thing, but what we know of its history suggests that its introduction to Europe was in the second millennium AD, again well after the advent of Greek fire, albeit that it may have been an ingredient in later imitation recipes. Although the Byzantines were, of all the European and Middle Eastern powers, probably the best place to acquire saltpetre from China or India earlier than most records suggest, Greek fire appears in history just after the time that the Arabic expansion would have denied them an easy direct trade route to the Far East. So it seems fairly unlikely that this was an element of the liquid. The noise so described can more easily be explained by one of two other possibilities. The simple roaring of a high-intensity pressurised flame, which you get with any number of flamethrowers that you can get even today, or else potentially some other element involved in the mixture. Another story that goes around about Greek fire that's likely a myth is the idea of the liquid undergoing auto or self-ignition on contact with the air. Whilst such substances were known on occasion in the ancient world, the descriptions of Greek fire and its siphons available often mention a form of what we would today call a pilot light, similar again to modern flamethrowers, and it also fails the test of sanity. An intensely burning, hard-to-extinguish incendiary that ignites on contact with air would be near suicidal to carry for any amount of time aboard a wooden ship and would no doubt have killed and burned many involved in its preparation, given that it was stored in cauldrons, poured into grenades, and repeatedly loaded mid-battle into handheld projectors, at least on land. However, as well as being hard to extinguish, it's true that most accounts make mention of it either burning on water or being made to burn more intensely by water, or possibly even igniting because of contact with water, which is something we mentioned near the start of this video. So, what exactly was it likely to be made of? There seem to be three ingredients that are most likely beyond dispute. Naphtha, which is a catch-all term that could refer to anything from raw light crude oil to possibly some refined product of that oil or similar hydrocarbon. It's not pitch or tar, as these substances are specifically mentioned in various sources alongside but separate from Greek fire. The other two likely ingredients are resin and sulphur, the former most likely as a thickening agent to make the mixture more likely to stick to its target and possibly also to make it burn longer. It might also explain why the substance was preheated before being projected out of the siphons as most tree resins are solid at room temperature and would therefore be needed to be heated in order to melt and mix in with the rest of the ingredients. Sulphur would be a further incendiary element and also produce a certain amount of toxic fumes that would inhibit attempts at fighting the fire. A partial recipe found elsewhere in the Alexiad mentions both of these latter. This fire is made by the following arts. From the pine and certain such evergreen trees, inflammable resin is collected. This is rubbed with sulphur and put into tubes of reed, and is blown by men using it with violent and continuous breath. The, then, in this manner, it meets the fire on the tip, 
Anne catches light and falls like a fiery whirlwind on the faces of the enemies. The fourth possible ingredient is also the one with the most controversy. Although a mixture of naphtha, resin and sulphur would be quite the nasty incendiary, contact with water, either in the sea or by people who are trying to put out the fire, is relatively unlikely to either ignite it or to make it substantially worse. So some have suggested that the migrant chemists, or chemist, have either discovered calcium phosphide, which is possible to have made in, been made in the time period, albeit it would be a pretty new discovery at the time, or else by the introduction into the mixture of quicklime, which is unslaked calcium oxide. Now, the calcium phosphide releases spontaneously ignited phosphine on contact with water, whilst the calcium oxide, the quicklime, reacts extremely exothermically with occasional mild explosions, although this does not usually generate flame in and of itself. But it would potentially generate enough heat to ignite the other ingredients, or if the substance was already ignited, it would cause it to spit and scatter around in all directions if you poured water on it. Quicklime was also much more widely known, and we know that they were using it in various siege weapons on both sides, and so it's the more plausible ingredient of the two. So whilst it's unlikely that either option was a primary ingredient or a primary source of ignition, inclusion of one or the other, most likely quicklime, would certainly have made it a much more formidable substance if it was used in the presence of water. One last note. Some very select sources attribute a green flame to Greek fire. Whilst the majority, fair enough, don't, and the few depictions of it show more conventional colours, it's possible that the storage of a mixture that includes sulphur, which may by that point have degraded into sulfuric acid, in a copper or bronze container may then result in the formation of copper sulphate in the presence of heat, such as, you know, when the cauldron was being heated to prepare the liquid, in most accounts, just before it was projected. And thus, it's possible that as copper sulphate burns with a green flame, that there was the occasional incidental feature of green Greek fire. Now, you might think, well, that's all well and good, Drac, with you speculating on its chemical makeup and everything, but uh, how do you know this? Well, one thing, I'm an engineer, I do have a certain amount of chemical knowledge. For a second thing, I thought you might say that, so I thought I'd run some experiments of my own. Now, you know, in advance, I will say I did not recreate a siphon because, one, flipping expensive, and two, I'm pretty sure creating basically sticky napalm flamethrowers is probably illegal in the UK, um, and putting that up on video and saying, hey guys, look, I made this horribly illegal weapon of mass destruction, it's probably not good for the long-term... Um, long-term prospects of the channel, but um, mixing up the Greek fire itself uh, in controlled quantities I don't think is in any way, shape or form uh, against the law, and so I acquired the various ingredients that I mentioned in the video, and now we're going to see what effect it actually has in testing. Right, well, in this undisclosed location, which is basically the only place I could find that was willing to let me experiment <laughs> with uh, rather obviously dangerous things, we're going to give some Greek fire recipes a go. I've been working on these a little bit off camera to try and make sure it's in the ballpark, but we have a, a burner with a nice thick bed of ash and some damp timber because, of course, it is the UK, it's November, and there's been a lot of rain. So, you know, damp timber, like you'd have at sea, fantastic, spot on. Um, but we are going to do a couple of small scale tests first to prove the concept. So let's do those. Okay, so just going to do a few quick building up experiments. We're using about a third of a shot glass here, so you can see the setup. We've got a little um, alcohol burner. That's necessary because the pine resin is solid at room temperature, so that's one of the reasons, as I mentioned earlier, that we need to heat it, um, the whole mixture, but we're going to go in stages. Um, so this is just about a third of a shot glass worth of naphtha on its own, which means we don't need to heat it because it's just naphtha. Um, so what we're going to do is we have tongs, and we're always going to handle it with tongs. This is a bucket of water, so 
what we're going to do is take it over to the bucket of water and as you can see it's not a lot of flame it'll burn out but this is the effect of just naphtha burning on water this metal bucket is about half full nice gentle probably can't hear much but it'll burn itself out in 20 30 seconds or so there's not a tremendous amount to it and as you can tell you know okay it's a small amount but that's not really going to impress anyone it's already dying um, it's almost gone and of yes I have a respirator on because this is going to very quickly get um, a little bit more dangerous than it's gone right okay so we now have um, our container going to put those down and we're going to get our alcohol burner going and at this point I apologize if everything I say after now sounds a bit like I'm the pyro but I like my lungs so next stage is we have our container and we're going to add a few bits of pine resin to it. I don't know why I'm using the tongs, it's just you know pine resin, so this is a thickening agent, and we're also going to out of sight so you can't see the where I got it from. We're going to add back up to our third of shot glass worth of naphtha. And somewhere I have my inert wooden stirring stick. Now this has to be carefully managed because we want it to get hot enough to melt the pine resin but we don't want it so hot that the naphtha evaporates off because obviously in the actual preparation of Greek fire this would have been done in a pressurized container sealed container one of the hazards as it turns out of having an alcohol fueled burner in the wind is that it doesn't heat anywhere near as well as it does when it's in doors and it can just heat directly so this is kind of a few minutes later right so that's the pine resin has now dissolved pretty much fully into the naphtha and uh, once again Give it a quick warm up. Well, as you can see, with the pine resin as a thickener and a bit of an extra fuel source, that is a substantially more energetic burn. Also, interestingly, you can hear. Oh, yeah, it's making quite the sound. Now that is probably part of the origin of the roaring flame. So, again, small amount went out. That shot glass is down in there somewhere, who cares, whatever, we've got plenty more. So, the next one will be, again, a relatively easy one. We don't need the uh, alcohol burner for this, because this is gonna be An amount of naphtha again kind of about a third of a shot glass um, and to this we are going to be adding 
a measure of pure elemental sulfur. So this is one of the other hypothesized ingredients. So now you're beginning to understand why I'm wearing a mask. So fortunately sul fine sulfur being in a powder I can just stir that into a suspension. It won't last too long in inert naphtha. Uh, it will last long enough for our purposes. And the reason that I'm doing this is because well again you can see this is a considerably more enthusiastic than just the naphtha on its own um, there's lots of interesting sulfurous buildup on the inside of this shot glass um, so that's not usable. And again, a spitting, roaring thing when something comes in contact. Didn't last too long, though. So, our last mini test for the minute is going to be some pine resin and our measure of sulfur whoops got to get that back and our measure of naphtha and uh, stir it quickly to get the sulfur in suspension. And then grip in one hand. Oh, shoot. Well, that proves how flammable this stuff is. Um, so the, sulfur, the resin obviously at this point hasn't ha had a chance to dissolve in but it probably some of it will be melting in there and you can hear again there's a faint roar and now the spit from the sulfur as well so uh, this is why we're doing it out outside oh well uh, make sure there's no, no there's definitely sulfurous elements in that so right so the only other remaining part of this is the calcium oxide now the calcium oxide is there to provide heat when it reacts exothermically with water which should cause it to spit and maybe even auto ignite. Now, I'm not going to do a small scale experiment with that because, well, it's not going to contribute to the burning that we saw. Um, it's just going to, you know, maybe auto ignite it with water. So we can look at that later. But that's the proof of concept. So you can see how combining the sulfur or the pine resin gets much better results than the naphtha on its own. And that last abortive attempt, well, proves how dangerous it is. So, with all that in mind, we're going to go over to our bin full of damp timber. And we're going to try and not kill ourselves with that mix, except more, with some calcium oxide added as well. All right. Okay, so I've mixed up a mixture that's about three, four times as much as any individual mixture we've been testing so far. So basically the cumulative amount of the mixtures we've been testing. We have our bin with some damp wood in it. 
and I've added the calcium oxide as well because damp wood it might react a bit more so let's see I need to heat it up get that resin melted and then we'll see how this goes okay so here is our hot liquid Greek fire mix a couple of bits of resin left in there but um, Jeez. Well, that's definitely burning on wet wood. Um, in fact, that's burning on ash, which burn, which embered out for about two days. So there's nothing in there combusting except the Greek fire. Um, the camera view is probably not that great is it? No it's fine. Okay cool. So that was a bit of a surge. Let's try that again. Okay so it's been about what, five minutes and the ash is still burning. So, while we don't have a siphon, I've mixed up a second batch. Um, I've let it cool a bit, that's why I'm able to hold it. Let's see what happens if I just chuck it on. So this is low, low pressure siphon. Well, there's your roaring flame. And, uh, Yeah, I'd say that's found something virulent to catch to. Again, there's some damp wood there, but the obviously because there's only three sticks rather than a whole plank deck, the vast majority of this stuff has just fallen straight onto ash. There is nothing for it to burn other than it itself. You can hear the roaring, and even now you can hear a faint hissing. And that hissing, I suspect, is the calcium oxide reacting with any remaining damp in the sticks. Now, the big question is going to be what happens when I make up a third batch once we let this burn for a bit. So, catch you in a second. Okay, so this is about 10 minutes later, and there is still a pile of ash burning, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, well, we're going to add the last of our mixture. This is still your basic calcium oxide, resin, naphtha, and sulfur mixed together, heated up. And this is the part where I hope I haven't spilled any on myself because this is probably going to get interesting. Three, two, one. There is a roaring flame for you. So, just for reference, literally everything that you've seen so far, these three larger tests and the smaller ones, have collectively used less volume of liquid Greek fire than you'd probably find in a single Greek fire hand grenade. You can see it's still hissing and roaring away. Um, so, gives you some idea of just how potent this stuff is. Because, as I said before, if this was a standard flame, this stuff would, uh, would have burnt out long ago, but it's still going. Um, it'll be interesting to see how long this one lasts. Three, two, one. Whoa! There is a roaring flame for you.
And for those of you who are interested, here it is, still burning 15 to 20 minutes later, just, you know, happily consuming itself and a little bit of the sticks on ash. So, have we recreated Greek fire? I uh, don't know. We're, I think we've certainly got close to some of the effects. It is seems to be self-sustaining for a very long time. It's relatively sticky. Um, it burns with a roaring sound far beyond the measure of its volume. And as I said, we probably use less than half a litre, you know, less than 500 mil total during this entire experimental phase. Of course, we don't have a siphon. We don't have very large quantities of it because, well, the testing ground, apart from anything else, was, as you can see, was fairly compact. And because we also didn't have a large body of water, we couldn't test whether or not it would auto-ignite because, obviously, things like calcium oxide, it, the amount of heat it would generate would scale. So, hopefully, these small-scale experiments have given you some idea of what it might have been like uh, to have at least small quantities of Greek fire thrown around. And, well, if you would like me to try and organise some kind of larger scale experiment to look at Greek fire or potential recipes for Greek fire in larger quantities, then, well, I can consider it. Um, I might make something of a project of it, but uh, that will be for the future. In any case, thank you very much for watching and see you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.